All right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our safety webinar on understanding the latest chain and motor standards for entertainment applications. My name is Gisela Clark. I'm the Senior Digital Marketing Specialist for Columbus McKinnon and will be your host for today's webinar. Presenting today will be Brian Leister. Brian is a Senior Technical Trainer with Columbus McKinnon, specializing in entertainment rigging, rope access, and hoist maintenance. He has 14 years of experience as a rigging professional in the entertainment industry and 10 years of industrial rope access experience. The advancement and sharing of knowledge are Brian's greatest passions. He values his role as a trainer as his greatest privilege. Supporting Brian today will be Nick Fleming, business development specialist for our CM Entertainment division. Nick has been a contributor to the entertainment technology community for over 10 years. He served in the management role overseeing rigging at a large theme park and owned his own rigging business that served as a warranty service center for Columbus McKinnon. Nick joined our company back in 2017. Before we begin, there are just a few things we'd like to cover. And Brian, if you could advance the slides, please. One more. Perfect. So we will be recording the session today and the recording link will be added to our YouTube channel. So you will be receiving an email with a link to that recording to follow. Uh, everyone in attendance and those who registered and couldn't attend will receive that link within a couple of days. Um, everyone is in listen only mode. So we encourage you to ask questions in our Q&A pane. Several of you have already responded to my first question, which was, um, which was where in the world are you today? Which is great to see all the feedback. But as I said, if you have any questions as we go along, please feel free to use that pane and we will take five to 10 minutes at the end to answer your questions. Lastly, after each webinar, we select one of the questions to be used in our blog the following week. We have a blog with over 200 technical articles about lots of different things that we do at Columbus McKinnon, pretty much focused on education. And if your question is chosen from our webinar, we'll send you a, a fun thing, a, a shirt, hat, work glove, something like that as a thanks. So please send in your questions today. We'd love to, um, to see them and feature one or two of them in a blog in the following weeks to come. So thank you for your attention today. And now I'd like to turn the meeting over to Brian Leister so that we can begin. Brian? Hi, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Just getting a few text messages from some of the folks in the webinar. If you guys can post your questions on the, um, the Q&A part, <clears throat> that would help a lot so I don't have to keep grabbing my phone and everyone else can hear those questions as well. So today's topics are going to be the updates to ANSI E1.6-2. Right, this is an ESSA standard published through ANSI for the um, entertainment technology design, inspection, and maintenance of electric chain hoists for the entertainment industry. And they updated this standard for 2018. Our last update was in 2013. So we're going to be looking at the differences from what it says in 2013 to now in 2018. Uh, we'll also be looking at service classifications, frequent inspections, and load testing are the three changed uh, the language in the standard. And then we'll take a quick look at some new chain inspection criteria that our engineers have put out there. So first of all, let's talk about what is ANSI, what is ESTA. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, ESTA is the Entertainment Services and Technology Association. Uh, it's uh, Similar to ANSI, it's a consensus standard group that gets together. It's rigging professionals, rigging manufacturers that get together and talk about the standards by which we operate in entertainment. Now, at the end of this webinar, there's going to be a link where you can find these standards. Your typical ANSI standards are going to cost money. So if you want the Z359 fault protection standard, you'd have to go onto the ANSI store and purchase that. Now, the really great thing about ESTA, what they've been doing for the entertainment community these several past years, is uh, they make the standards free. So they're, like I said, there's a link at the end. You'll be able to go on that link and download standards, not just for uh, chain hoist, but there's ones for wire rope ladders, fog machines, lasers, all sorts of different things. Uh, and all those standards are uh, accessible to everyone for free. Now, the entertainment standards group, uh, publishes the standard through ANSI. So a little bit of a misconception that I get a lot in my training classes is, you know, why does ANSI get to make all the rules and all this? Well, ANSI doesn't actually make any rules. They publish standards. They kind of, in a, in a roundabout way, they kind of host these groups of different professionals around, around the world that 
um, create working groups and create these standards. ANSI is just the publisher of those standards. The Entertainment uh, Technical Standards Committee or program is comprised of over 350 subject matter experts. And those people devote their time and energy. Um, they don't get paid to do this for the benefit of the entire entertainment technology industry. Let's dive right into some of the changes to E1.6-2. So in 2013, the service classification for hoists uh, had a severe service classification added to it. Now this is different than the industrial standard under ASME uh, B30.16 that the industrial world follows. There was no severe service in that standard. There was only heavy. Well, in 2013, the ANSI standard added, added a severe service, which says that the hoist operates in excess of 200 days per year. Now, realistically, in the entertainment industry, it's very difficult to account for every single use of the hoist every time it gets used. So just for definition purposes, anytime the hoist is operated up or down, that counts as a use for the day. So whether you go up and down 20 times or one time, it's a use for the day. But in entertainment, we tend to have rental hoists a lot. You know, a lot of rental companies send hoists out. Uh, they don't know how many times or how many days out of the year that the hoist spends on a truck versus how many times it goes up and down. So it's very difficult to account for that exact 200 number. Um, in the 2018 standard, we've redefined severe service. And severe service no longer has anything to do with how many days of the year the hoist gets used. Severe service is defined by the environment in which that hoist is being used. In entertainment, we often use our hoists outside, uh, exposed to the elements, or we use them in proximity to things like pyrotechnics or special effects. And those kind of environments can have a, uh, a damaging effect on the hoist. Uh, anyone who's been using hoist outside and in proximity to pyrotechnics knows that that chain gets caked with oxidizing material and it has to be cleaned and relubricated a lot more often than before. So the severe service classification is gonna require a more frequent inspection and a more uh, periodic inspection routine. The next section there is 4.1.2, and that defines normal service. In our 2013 version of the standard, we're looking at it, the hoist operates 200 or less days per year, but more than 25. Uh, again, it's very difficult to track that in the entertainment industry. So now we're just saying the hoist operates more than 25 times per year. So Brian, real quick, um, I know in the past, the CM manual had differed a little bit from the ANSI standard and, and may have been a little bit confusing at times, but I know recently CM has made a, a much better uh, effort to try to align our manuals with the ANSI standard. Uh, can you go into whether this will affect, this, these new changes will affect um, our manual and whether we're gonna be updating them? Well, in fact, the this standard, the 2018 ANSI standard, was published uh, earlier this year in 2018. It was like, I think, March or May. I can't remember the exact date. But our most recent hoist manual update for entertainment was January. So our newest hoist manual came out in January. The standard changed in March uh, or May. I can't remember which. Um, but you can expect that we will update our manual to follow up with this change in the standard. Um, that manual download can be found on cmworks.com. If you go to our cmworks.com website, you click on library, you can get the manuals for all of the products that you're looking for. Um, if you're entertainment based, you should go on to www.cm-et.com if you want to find the manual specific to entertainment. Gotcha. Thank you. So some other changes that we have to E1.6-2 uh, are our frequent inspection table. So prior to 2018, we had a very short list of frequent inspection items. And for those of you who are not familiar with the frequent inspection uh, criteria, that's a, an inspection by a competent person or an authorized person um, of the external conditions of the hoist. So this isn't involving like opening up the hoist or any of that kind of stuff. This is looking at the hoist braking system for proper operation. We're looking at the hooks and attachment hardware. 
Uh, the load chain, make sure it's lubricated, looking for signs of wear, damage, links, corrosion, foreign matter. Well, if it's a double reeved unit, we're also looking for uh, twists or in proper reeving in the chain and make sure our limit switches work. So a lot of this can be done through like an operational test, uh, running the hoist up and down and an external visual examination. Now we've added a couple of things from the periodic inspection chart into the frequent inspection chart. And those things are in bold below. That's evidence of lubricant leakage. That's looking at the outside of the hoist, especially the gasketed areas that contain the grease filled gearbox, making sure that we're not getting any kind of grease coming out. And also, just as importantly, making sure we're not getting other contaminants into the grease that can compromise its ability to lubricate the gears. The next, the next new one is electrical cores, grommets, connectors, cables, and control station enclosure. Um, the control station enclosure is just a fancy way of saying the pickle. Uh, in the industrial world, the pickle is usually hardwired attached to the hoist. Now, in entertainment, we typically leave that open so that we can patch it into a control system or move the pickle from one hoist to the other. But that's something that not only should be done on the frequent inspection, you know, regular weekly or monthly, however your service does. That's something that's the best thing you operate on. You're looking at those boards and making sure they're not pulled out, that someone try to use it like a handle. You're looking for cracks and stuff like that because you don't want to get shocked. And then the third thing that's new to frequent inspections are signs of impact damage to the housing or cracked covers. If you get cracks in your housing or your frame, chances are something else is going to be damaged in the hoist and should not be used. And this is a quick check. I mean, when you're doing your operational check, when you're just handling the hoist, you should be looking for these things every time you touch the hoist, um, not just for your frequent inspection criteria. So, Brian, real quick, you know, it's probably obvious to some, but not for all. Um, these these three that were moved from the periodic into the frequent, um, all the frequent inspection items have to be done on the on the periodic uh, inspection as well. So, just to just to reiterate that, just because it was moved from a periodic to a frequent, doesn't mean it doesn't need to be done in the periodic. They all of those whatever that is eight items or so um, all have to be done in the periodic. Just the same. Yeah, that's that's 100 accurate there. Uh, the very first line of your periodic inspection table it says all items covered in frequent inspection. Another new change to the standard is uh, over travel positions. So we've added some language here um, in 2013 over travel positions with section 3.8. In the 2018 version, we retitled that to over travel protection and added a uh, small paragraph at the bottom there that says design and construction of the hoist shall ensure that travel will be limited such that no unsafe conditions shall occur. And this kind of lends itself to the practice of putting on chain stops on your loose end of the chain. So before the standard only really covered the upper limit travel, making sure the hook couldn't get sucked into the hoist. But there's also a, a definite danger, especially when the hoist is uh, motor up or in the what we call an entertainment inverted position, that you don't, you're not able to physically run the chain through the hoist and then drop the entire chain. And to prevent that, so that no safe condition shall occur, we would put on a physical chain stop that would uh, hit the body of the hoist and engage the load protector and cause it to where the chain could not get sucked through the hoist and dropped from the air. Now, it's not a acceptable practice to do that on purpose, but um, our limits are not show limits or um, trim height limits or anything like that. They are specifically designed to prevent an unsafe condition. Next is load testing, um, static load test was still defined in the 2013 standard under section 2.13. And that's where you're not actually operating the hoist in a load test. You have a machine that's pulling against the hoist so the hoist can be tested in this way without actually being powered on or operated. The definition for that static load test no longer exists in the 2018 standard. And that's because dynamic load testing is the only recognized method according to this ANSI standard. 
So that leads us to what is a dynamic load test? And that is a test where the hoist is applied, a load is applied to the hoist, and at a minimum lifted the distance required to completely test the power transmission system. So typically that's gonna be a foot. You need to be able to lift an entire foot up and down um, to accomplish a load test. And the load that you have to apply is gonna be 125% of the hoist rating capacity if approved by the manufacturer, which CM does approve. It's in our manual. Uh, we want you to test it at 125%. And if the operation of an overload protection device prevents the lifting of 125%, then you can reduce the load down to um, a minimum of the rating capacity of the hoist. Now I'll tell you from experience that our clutch mechanisms, our overload protectors are not meant to slip at 125% meant to slip at a much higher amount. So you should be testing a CM hoist to 125%. Brian, I have a quick question. Why are static load tests no longer recognized by the ANSI E62, E162 standard? Well, they don't actually provide you with an uh, actual diagnostic of the hoist operation. They're really just checking to make sure that the gearing and the brakes the physical mechanical components of the hoist will hold a load, but you can actually get a hoist um, wired incorrectly or insufficiently to where it will move up and down, but it's not getting enough power to lift the full load. And I've actually had this happen during a load test one time. I had a hoist that was, that was on my bench. I ran it up, I ran it down, I, I checked the limits and everything seemed normal. And then I put it on the load test machine or on the, on the load test rig to lift the load and it wouldn't lift because it wasn't getting full power. We had, a, it was a pinched wire or a loose wire, or something of that nature. So to really check to see if the hoist will lift its full rated load, you have to do a dynamic load test. Okay, okay, thanks. No, thank you. Uh, a new section to the ANSI standard is gonna be 4.3.5. Um, and that is that the hoist shall be load tested no less than one time per year with records of the test recorded. Now, this is something that a lot of shops, um, my old team, that we used to load test our hoist every year regardless. So some people may have been doing this already for a long time, but um, other people might not have been. And now it doesn't matter if that hoist, if you took it apart, if you, before you had to do a load test, if you replace a load bearing component, um, which some of those components would be the suspension hook, the lower hook, the lift wheel, lift wheel bearings, um, the frame that holds all that in. Those are some of the load bearing components covered under the requirement for load testing. But now, even if you don't replace those components, you have to do a load test every year to be compliant to this ANSI standard. Another update and a question that comes up a lot during our uh, motor classes is testing of the clutch. So in the standard, it says that testing of the overload protection device shall be performed according to the manufacturer's recommendations. A lot of people ask, what are our recommendations? In the manual, it says that when you do a load test of 125%, you should also test the clutch. Now to test the clutch, you have to be very careful because you're going to be putting loads on the hoist that are far higher than its rated load. So it needs to be designed, the testing, could be designed by a qualified person, someone who's like an engineer, uh, so that you're not overloading your anchor points, you're not gonna damage the hoist or anything like that. Now, when you go to slip the clutch, the clutch should slip at or below 230% of the rated load. If it doesn't slip at 230% of the rated load, you need to let it cool off for five minutes between testing. When that clutch engages, or even when it tries to engage, there is a huge amount of heat that builds up inside there. So never slip the clutch more than two seconds at a time. And acknowledge that there's about 700 degrees of heat happening inside that clutch mechanism. If you keep it slipping, it's going to heat up to the point where the lubrication that's packed in there is going to get pushed out and the whole thing will fuse into one solid gear. So test your clutches at two, uh, up to 230%. They should slip around 200, um, but no more than 230%. If yours doesn't slip, you can try it again after five minutes. 
But if it doesn't slip after that, my recommendation would be send it to a, um, a CM authorized repair shop. And there are plenty of those around the country. Yeah, Brian, I could even I could even include a link to those in the follow up email to everybody who's in attendance, along with a link to the manuals um, for the ET products on our website. So, OK, go ahead. Sorry. All right. And uh, like Gisela said earlier, we're going to be a little bit quick with this webinar compared to some of our other ones. Uh, we've only got, I think, two more slides to cover here. And now we're talking about chain inspection and where. So we have a, a sheet right here. This is new from our engineering people that talk about when you need to replace the chain. Now we see a lot of different values up here and a couple of different dimensions. Um, dimension A is the thickness of the wire of each individual link, right? And this isn't meaning that you go in and measure every single link of a chain because that would take a really long time. But when you see a chain, a trained eye should be able to see that the chain looks different than it should, especially if you have a brand new one sitting on your desk or sitting around somewhere that you can compare it to. But to see if it's worn enough to, be, to warrant replacement, we have some values here under the replace category. So for dimension A, if you're talking about a large frame load star like a Model L, you measure it and if it is smaller than 0.281, you definitely need to replace it. And the, all those values are based on 90% of the nominal diameter of the chain wire. With dimension P, we're talking about an individual link, how much damage or how much wear can be exposed to, a, to one individual link. And for, again, we'll go with the model L large frame load star, that is 0.911. That's the space from the inside of the link to the inside of the, uh, the opposite end of that link. And that constitutes a 5% increase for one link. So these values are for typical wear at normal expected points. This isn't for like abnormal conditions. This is from normal operation. Hey, Brian, which tool is best to use for measuring wear on load chain? Well, we recommend a vernier caliper, preferably a digital one. And you might need a special caliper to measure certain things. So a knife blade caliper that measures both interior and exterior um, dimensions would be preferable for, for these measurements. OK, thank you. Thank you. And then finally, dimension C. Um, is based on a, an odd number of links for and a different number of odd number links for each type of chain. So if we look at the ProStar, for instance, we're going to look at 11 links. Now, the reason that's an odd number for all of these is because you should notice that the chain alternates its facing from one link to the next. And if you were to measure an even number, you would be measuring one link turned 90 degrees uh, compared to it, the first link that you're measuring. So you wanna measure an odd number of links and a minimum number of 11 links for your ProStar chain, and then a minimum number of five links for your other chains from small frame all the way up to the RRS. And then we have a replacement criteria for those. And that criteria is based on an increase of 1.5% of the overall length. Now there's a lot of data here, um, but like I said, when we first started with this slide, you should be able to visually see this. If you're trained on how to inspect chain, you should be able to see that there's something wrong with the chain. And me the measurement is there to confirm what you would suspect when you look at it and, and think that it's worn. And then finally, we're talking about nicks and gouges, and this is a little different than uh, what some of our training classes had said in the past. Um, in fact, it's a little bit more lenient than what we usually train on. And before any nicks or gouges, uh, we said replace them at 0 0.005 inches for any nick or a gouge. But now we're clarifying a little bit differently that tensile versus compressive nicks and uh, areas are different. So a tensile area is what we call a high concern area. That's where the material is being pulled apart from itself, all right? Those areas, any nick or gouge in those areas should be replaced if it is greater than 0.005 inches. 
And Gisela asked before, what kind of tool do we use to measure chain? In yeah. this scenario, you'd want to use a needle point type caliper, something that can get into that little gouge or nick to measure it. Something with a really small diameter, like a pin. Um, otherwise, we're looking at compressive stress on the blue areas of the chain link. And those are of a slightly lower concern. And we, we want to replace those at 0 0.010 inches. Okay, that, that's very helpful. I'm going to go ahead, if you don't mind, Brian, and launch a polling question. Um, this has to do for cleaning chains, since we're on the topic of chains. So which method do you prefer for cleaning chains? If everybody could please vote, we'd love to see your answers here. Um, and if you are on an iPad, you can just uh, send us your comment in via the Q&A pane. But which method do you prefer for cleaning chains? Parts washer with degreaser, by hand with brushes or rags, a chain tumbler, or we just don't clean our chains? So it's collecting responses, Brian. It looks like a good majority, probably half. Use a chain tumbler. Follow That's the way to go, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, yeah, about now it's about 40%. About 25, 30% are using the parts washer with degreaser um, and uh, by hand with brushes or rags. And there's just a small 4%, 3% group that tend not to clean the chain. So, yeah, you can go ahead and share your comments. So, you're recommending the chain tumbler as the best means of cleaning chains. Yeah, looking at each of those different categories. So, say you're washing it with a parts washer and degreaser, that, that's going to give you really clean chain. But my concern there would be that you're going to carry some of that degreaser back in to the machine when you introduce the chain back in, unless you've dried it off perfectly, you know, opened up every link and gotten all that degreaser out. That's something that could get mixed in with your oil and kind of compromise the integrity of your oil. I'm not saying not to do it. I'm just saying you need to be mindful that you're not migrating some of that degreaser in with your oil when you put the chain back into the hoist. Uh, those are those people who do it by hand. Uh, bless your hearts. That's that's <laughs> a job right there. Um, that used when before the shop I used to work in before we had the chain tumbler. That was a uh, new guy detail. Uh, that's the person you know. The new guys would be the ones cleaning the chains. Uh, my preference would be the chain tumbler. Uh, the chain tumbler. You can put some dirty chain in that thing, and you put it in with like walnut shells, which are you know pretty cheap to get, and uh, you put that in there, you start tumbling it, and then you go work on your hoist. So to me, this is the most efficient and effective method for cleaning change. Now, again, this is my personal opinion as a, as a motor tech that's worked on motors for a long time. I recommend doing the chain tumbler. You, you got to set it up right. Um, I usually zigzag my chain uh, in one, two, three you know, back and forth, and then I zip tie it together every like three to five feet. And this helps prevent knots getting into the chain. Okay. So you throw that in the chain tumbler, you turn around, you work on your hoist. To me, it's very efficient because you're not uh, dedicating all that time to hand brushing the chain or anything like that. So, and those of you who don't clean your chains, I hope it's because that's not part of your job and not because you're just not cleaning your chains. Okay. And I have one more question, if you don't mind. It is, yeah. um, what's the most common reason you have seen for retiring load chain? Um, is it because of rust and corrosion, wear from lack of lubrication, nicks and gouges, or you've never had to retire any chain? So again, if everyone could please vote here, we would appreciate it. So again, what is the most common reason you've seen for retiring load chain? Rust and corrosion, wear from lack of lubrication, nicks and gouges, or you've never had to retire any? And it looks like, again, about 50% roughly are saying nicks and gouges is the number one reason. And uh, the next, some people say they've never had to retire any chain, about 25%. And then the other 25%, 26% is split between rust and corrosion and wear from lack of lubrication, Brian. Yeah, I'd say that tracks uh, pretty well with my personal experience. Uh, rust and corrosion, if you catch it, soon enough you'll be able to clean that chain and put it back into service it's really only extensive like when you get pitted rust little you know divots in the chain from the rust that you'd have to retire it so that this should be one of the least common uh wear from lack of lubrication that one is is huge um but it's one of the most avoidable ones that's out there because if you just lubricate that chain it, it'll literally last forever 
mixing gouges, that's, you know, um, one of the things that can kill a chain really quick. You know, like they say, it only takes one link to fail and the entire chain to fail. It only takes one nick or a gouge to really cut a piece of chain down to a much shorter length. And that can happen very quickly. Okay, perfect, Brian. I'll turn it back over to you and then we can take some questions. Sure. So the, uh, the last slide that we have here is just a, a link to the ESTA website where you can download the standards. There are two standards for chain hoist. One is E1.6-2, which is what we've been talking about today. The other one is E1.6-3, and that one is the use of chain hoist. So the people who are end users that are out there using hoist should be familiar with this standard as well. But like I said, ESTA has a, a whole bunch of standards about a variety of different entertainment topics. So take a good look up there, download those standards, uh, talk about them with people you work with, uh, make sure that you're compliant to those because they will help protect you in the long run. And Gisela, will they go get a link to that in the email or something? Is that Perfect. Correct? I would be glad to include it along with the other things I mentioned as well. I'll just make a quick note. But yes, I'll definitely include the ESTA link. Thanks, Brian. Great. All right. Well, I guess we can open up to some Q&A then. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Our first question is this one. Are physical chain stops going to be required for safety in the future? Um, if I were the one making that decision, I would say yes. Uh, in the classes that I teach, I tell people to put uh, chain stops on their dead end chains um, as a, you know, as a rule. I think that they're a much safer way to go. All it takes is for that uh, hoist to be double phase reversed, which sounds kind of weird, but I had one the other day mm -hmm. where the power was reversed and the control was reversed. So the hoist was operating up when I set up and down when I set down, but the limits weren't working. Okay. And uh, that can definitely cause the chain to come out. So you gotta be careful of that kind of stuff. Having a physical barrier there that can prevent that would be um, the best way to go. Okay, perfect. So um, someone posted, uh, so no more static load tests. And uh, Nick, Nick responded that they're, they're still a good test, but a dynamic test is now required as part of a periodic inspection. Do you have anything more to add to that? No. Um, yeah, there's still like some diagnostic uh, benefit to doing static load tests. So I wouldn't say throw your static load test machines out if you got them. But uh, yeah, the requirement is every year um, you got to do a dynamic load test. You got to lift 125% of your rating capacity for at least a foot and back down to verify that the hoist operates correctly. Okay, perfect. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, let's see. So, is there a proposed method to test 230% of the max load on a one-ton hoist? Um. That's a really tricky question. Uh, we don't have a, a specific operation uh, to do that. Now, I have been in the factory, and they have a machine that does it in the factories, but I don't think you can just buy a machine like that. Um, the best thing to do would be to have a qualified person, like an engineer, design such a um, method, or to send the, the clutch out to um, yeah, Brian, I'll chime in a little bit on that one. You know, if if, if you have a test stand that's capable of lifting the 230%, then you can you can test the clutch like that. Um, like I said, you just gotta just gotta line up the, the weights properly. Perfect. Okay. There's also a big difference between the classic load stars and the new gen or the new hoist load stars. And that is that the clutch is in a different location. So in the old way, the classic load stars, you could actually put those in a static test machine and pull against them to get the clutch to slip. But that's no longer the case with the new generation load stars. The clutch is now coupling the rotor and the drive shaft. So you actually have to be operating the hoist to try to slip the clutch. And, and that can be a very precarious position if you don't have the proper safety protocols in place. Okay. 
All right, so another comment came in. Uh, Brian said to send it back to the authorized repair shop if the clutch doesn't slip after two attempts. Should we send the entire hoist for repair or just the clutch itself? Well, that depends on if the authorized service center has the ability to test the clutch outside of the hoist. If they do, I would say replace it, replace your clutch with a new one, send that one out for testing. Um, and that would be a good way to keep your hoist in service. But if the authorized service center doesn't have a method for doing that, you might have to send the whole hoist. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had some questions about our wear gauge tools and things like that. It may have already been addressed, but um, yeah, we're. Uh, what we'll probably do is follow up on some of the questions that were asked, and we'll follow up with you personally on those questions that were asked about uh, the chain wear gauges. Um, yes, a question was asked whether a chain tumbler is good for rusty chain. <laughs> and yeah, uh, yeah, please, it works like magic, right? Yep. Perfect. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, you might need to leave it in a little bit longer, but it works great. Okay, cool. Yeah. Perfect. So what oil is recommended or required by um, for CM for their chains? What do we recommend for use with our chains? Uh, Luber Plate 10R. Uh, it is a bar and chain oil, and it is, it is designed with um, extreme pressure rating so other oils might get squeezed out i mean you're talking about literally we've done engineering analysis on this and literally 500,000 psi pounds per square inch of pressure are happening if you take a, a 5 16 chain model l load star you load it to capacity the pressure between from one link to the next is 500,000 psi so you can't just put like any old lubrication in there uh, that'll literally just get squeezed right out between the links. But Luber Plate 10R by Fisk Brothers Refinery is what we recommend in our manual. Uh, we say that or its equivalent. Now, I get a lot of people ask me, well, what is the equivalent? Well, to be honest, we don't make oil. Uh, we don't make the bar and chain oil. So if you were going to use an alternative to Luber Plate 10R, contact the manufacturer that product to determine if it is the equivalent. Yeah, and Brian, I'll also include that lubricant in our follow-up email, okay? Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, I think it's, it's in the manual as well. It's like in there several times that we talk about the Luber Plate 10R. Okay, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, we have it many different, you're, you're right. We have it, we, yeah. we reference it quite a bit, yes. And the Brian, just, just to emphasize, you know, if, if people go looking for an equivalent, um, as you said, you're going to have to get the 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 luber plate specs to figure out what an equivalent it is but you know one of the biggest properties of 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 the luber plate is the extreme pressure additive so as you're doing your investigations the extreme pressure additive is probably the first thing you're looking for when you're trying to find an equivalent okay perfect um a few more questions that we're going to wrap up so uh the next one is what's the recommended time spent tumbling tumbling the chain well, that really depends on how dirty the chain is, um, but I would say 45 minutes uh, on average. You know, if it's a really nasty chain, you might want to leave it in a little bit longer. Um, but 45 minutes is usually ideal. Okay, perfect. What about nicks and gouges in the areas not considered tensile or compressive? Well, there is every part of the chain is either ten in tension or compression. Now, the drawing that we had up on the slide, um, I'll pop that back up for us real quick. That's just showing the outer portions, right? Because those are the portions that are most likely subject to nicks and gouges. Um, typically, the interior oval of the chain is protected because you have a link on one end and a link on the other. Um, the only way to get nicks and gouges in there is to, you know, you got to try to get a nick or a gouge inside that. Um, so we are just covering the outer edges of the chain in this nicks and gouges uh, requirement or retirement criteria. 
Okay, thank you, Brian. And I think we've got one final question. I think another couple will be, um, again, if your question hasn't been asked, it will be, it will be handled directly by Nick uh, after the session. So do you have any recommendations for purchasing a chain tumbler? Um, well, the one that we had in the shop I used to work in years and years and years and years ago, in years past, uh, that was a concrete mixer with the blade removed. And when choosing one, I would choose one that is low to the ground. All right. You don't want one that's like, you know, at um, abdomen height or higher because though they tend to roll around a lot. You got a lot of chain in there. And what happens with the taller ones, they start to walk. I was working on a motor one time and uh, I saw the chain tumbler in my, in the left, my left field of vision. And then I noticed it wasn't there anymore. And I noticed I couldn't hear it anymore. And I was by myself at that time. So I'm like, who shut the chain tumbler off? And I turned around and it had literally walked itself because of the rocking motion, walked itself forward to the point where it unplugged from the wall. So a low ground, low to the ground one is the best one. It's also better so that you don't end up, you know, tipping it over when you go to get the chain out if it's already low center of gravity. Okay. So that would be my recommendation. A cement mixer, low to the ground, with the blade removed or the blade not even included to begin with. I think uh, to add on to that, Brian, uh, a plastic one is probably uh, the best suited. If you get a, a metal tumbler, um, a metal on metal isn't isn't it's probably not going to do much damage to the chain, but it's awfully loud in your shop. So uh, yeah. a plastic tumbler tends to work a little better for that. Yeah, I agree completely. Okay, perfect. All right. Well, we will, um, any additional questions that come up, we'll be handling directly uh, after the session. So Brian, why don't you go ahead and close? Cause we always like to try to honor the 45 minute time that we, we say we're going to be speaking. So if you can just go to the end, here is contact information for Brian Leister and Nick Fleming. Uh, so if you want to jot that down quick, as I said, they will be personally following up on all the, the questions that we haven't been able to get to today. And if you can just go one more slide now, Brian, while they're writing that, just some upcoming classes we have, you can find us, um, all of our training courses for our entertainment and industrial uh, uh, products, all on training.cmworks.com. We have an upcoming RTC Motor School that will be in Lidditz, PA, in December 19th through 20th. We have a Sprat a rope access course that will be coming um, in January, February, and March. You can register on our site there. And then also we have in January 14th through 18th at our Lidditz PA facility, our CMET five-day rigor boot camp. So if you have any interest there, you can reach out to, you can go back to your contact information, Brian, just if they want to jot it down one more time. Perfect. So if you have any questions, all the information's on our training.cmworks.com website, or please feel free to email Brian or Nick about any of that information. So we just want to thank you for your time today. As I said, we'll be coming back to you personally on your questions that were not yet answered. And we will be sharing a recording and we will be including a lot of the information that was um, that was mentioned, like I said, to the manuals, resources, to the, um, the ET product, the ESTA link, uh, and the oil recommendation that both Brian and Nick referenced. So, uh, again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope you can join us again in the future. Everyone have a nice uh, rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.